So today's going to be a very interesting uh, podcast. Uh, I'm sure you're hearing about and, and been following the COVID-19 pandemic and what's going on. Uh, today, I've brought some experts in their field from insurance, uh, financial, uh, doctor, a PhD in, in health, as well as a uh, osteopathic manual practitioner to really kind of talk about what's going on in the media, really kind of demystify all the kind of the fear-based media, some of the challenges that are coming up uh, through the media and, and people are concerned about, and what strategies to do going forward that we need to really kind of take on to help us get through this pandemic and help support our, our family, our friends, and our community. So this is going to be a really great episode. Grab a tea, grab a coffee, uh, get ready. It's a little bit of a longer episode but a lot of great information. So let's hack at it. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, guys, for coming out to this discussion of COVID-19. Uh, as I mentioned in kind of the intro, uh, we are talking to some experts in their fields from financial to insurance to osteopathic and practitioners in health, as well as a doctor, Dr. April, we have here. Uh, Dr. April, I'm going to start with you first, because uh, really kind of think we need to know the information uh, regards to kind of what is COVID-19 and, you know, what do we really need to know about this? So COVID-19 originated in 2019. It is a coronavirus and people are referring to it as corona or other things, but there are many coronaviruses out there. There are several types of coronaviruses, including SARS. As we know, SARS was a, a past pandemic that occurred, and this is a variant of SARS. Its official name includes the words SARS in it, and it originated in Wuhan, China, and has been spreading since 2019. That's the year that it was discovered, identified, hence the name COVID-19. And so we do need to take this very seriously. It has been highly contagious and it does affect the lungs and some people are contagious and not showing symptoms. And so it spread um, very much so in Italy now where we're seeing more uh, prevalence and incidence of this virus. So prevalence meaning existing cases, incidence meaning new cases of the virus. And we're seeing both of those things continuing to increase in Italy. And then we are also seeing some of that beginning to emerge in the United States. And so the precautions are to, um, as you've probably heard, to wash your hands for about 20 seconds vigorously, just making sure you've washed every part of your hands. Also staying away from crowded places staying away from places where there are a lot of people and interactions. As we know at this time, travel's being restricted. Um, in some locations, just even person-to-person -person interaction is increasingly becoming more and more restricted. It has gone from reducing space of like 150 people down to 100 people, 50 people. Now we're looking at 10 or even down to no other people around you. And so, uh, we're still able to go to the supermarket and able to order food and things like that. But for the most part, a lot of businesses have closed down. And really at this time, it's just like your banks, your gas stations, your pharmacies and your supermarkets and ordering takeout from restaurants is uh, your only options at this time. And because the reason we do this is because we need to serve the public in terms of community and global health prevent the spread of this disease. And so even again, if you don't have symptoms, you run the risk of still being highly contagious to other people. Even if you get through it and you are in relatively good health, you are risking the health of the vulnerable population, people who are over 65, people with pre-existing health conditions, people with chronic health conditions who may not be able to get through the virus, the illness, as as unscathed as other people. Right. So, and, and that's something I think, like you said, and, and to address this, you know, the healthy people potentially are the carriers, right? They're the carriers of the virus that can go from person to person, place to place, surface to surface, and they can carry out and that can be contracted to other people. And, and then now it propagates. I saw uh, on an article, I think it was by the Globe and Mail, they were actually showing a GIF 
on the image and how it could populate through the communities. So healthy people need to kind of take this really into consideration of that they're actually helping to alleviate this from contracting and from actually propagating through the, you know, like a virus and I'm an IT, you know, going through systems while well, now that's just going through people and we're trying to cut that off. So I was talking to someone the other day and they still believe that this is a hoax. And, you know, they're in the United States, but they haven't seen any cases in their community. They don't know anybody who has contracted COVID-19. So they still think that it's a hoax. And it's really hard for to convince people until they've actually seen it. Hence, that's why I think the news is so good at talking about COVID-19 and sharing information about what's going on around the world and why this is a severe issue, why this is an important pandemic that we need to consider. And, you know, sharing the number of people who are dying from it, the number of people who have been hospitalized. And so it's really important for us to communicate this concept of flattening the curve. So you may have seen that chart of flattening the curve. You've got your, your peak here, and then ideally it's going down in number. And basically this is about reducing or increasing capacity in the medical system. So we want to prevent a situation where we've got so many cases of COVID-19 people going into the hospital for treatment for respiratory disease, needing those ventilators and having like no opportunity to access this assistance, no treatment because of the fact that we are overloading hospitals at the same time. That's what that peak is. This is a situation where we actually have seen in Italy, for example, where doctors are so overloaded with COVID-19 patients where they don't have the ventilators, they don't have the capacity, they don't have the equipment or the staff to treat all of these people who have been hospitalized, having to make that crucial decision of who to serve, who to help, and who to let pass away. This is crucial. And this is why it's so important for us at this very time now to work on flattening that curve. And that involves social distancing, or in some places, social, so in some cases, social isolation, staying away from people in highly populated areas, staying away from people at all even, and avoiding the opportunity, avoiding the risk of contracting COVID-19 because we don't want it to increase and spread at this hugely exponential number where we can't even serve patients because we're overloaded with capacity. Okay, and that's a, that's a good point. So. Can you tell us a little bit more about the autoimmune disease? Like kind of what's the history? What's, what do we have to really know about it? Thank you for asking about autoimmune disease. There are over a hundred autoimmune diseases out there. These include disease, diseases such as lupus, type one diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and so on. And it can take anywhere from like five to seven years to, to get a correct diagnosis. And the reason why I know so much about autoimmune diseases is because I live with one. I was diagnosed with autoimmune disease in the final year of my dissertation. And it was so interesting because in public health, we talk so much about chronic disease. We talk about it so often from the context of type two diabetes, hypertension, high blood pressure, things that are pre preventable diseases for the most part. But in the case of autoimmune disease, this was a totally new realm of chronic disease that I began to learn about firsthand. And so the reason why chronic disease is so crucial to consider at this time in the season of COVID-19 is because of the fact that we are on disease modifying drugs, which suppress the immune system in many cases. For example, we can be on drugs that modify our, suppress our B cells, our, our T cells, our white, our white blood cell count. And so for this reason, we are immunocompromised in many cases, hence we are part of that vulnerable, vulnerable population at this time. And so in terms of COVID-19, we need to consider the fact that we are vulnerable to this situation and we are at risk of becoming more ill because of this virus, because of the fact that we are on these disease-modifying drugs. 
So now what about the, like the healthcare system? Like you're hearing right now that one of the concerns that three to 4%, right? That if get they contract the COVID-19, they are at high risk then to be severely in the hospital and potentially, you know, pass away or, you know, because of the medical community and everything that's happening because it's such a, a overtaxed on the system and the amount of available respiratory uh, systems and all, uh, um, you know, I'm trying to think of the uh, term, the respiratory devices that they have access to, right? Some of them are actually being used right now and there's a very limited amount. Now, is that true? So uh, we don't have a design that is sufficient to prepare ourselves for, they, they talk a lot, a lot about the flattening of the curve, uh, terminology that they're using. Um, in terms of providing supply and capability in terms of the workforce even to be able to provide the services. So if we don't handle this now and we get to that point where we are beyond capability to treat people with COVID-19 and other health conditions, you know, it's, it goes beyond even COVID-19 at this point. It's like anyone who's hospitalized, if we are out of capacity, we don't have the beds, we don't have the room, we don't have the equipment for respiration and respiratory assistance. Um, but then also, people are not fully trained. Also, let's say we did have all those all of that equipment. People have not been fully trained to that level of capacity to need that we, we encounter. Right. And, that, and that's something that people need to be concerned of, not fearful of, just be understanding that that's why we're quarantined. That's why we're taking these steps. It's not the point that it's the end of days, you know, it's, you know, you know, the zombie apocalypse and this is going to happen. It's OK. Just be mindful. This is what's happening. Right. And the false news is out that that, oh, my God, you know, three, four percent, you know, that scarcity that we're seeing. That's just numbers just to let you know, to be informed, not to put you into a fear state. Would you say that's fair? Okay, so I think about three camps here. When we think about a public health epidemic or pandemic at this point, we think about on one side, you have people who don't want to hear about it. You know, I actually had to leave a yoga training because we were on different sides where I was telling them about what's going on. And they're like, I don't want to hear this. You're ruining my sacred state. You know, and they're like, Let's not do this. So there's a head in the sand approach. So we don't want to hear it. We don't want to know about it. Turn off the TV. I don't care. Right. And then on the other side of the spectrum, it's like it's the end of the world. I better stockpile, um, head to the, the line at the gun store, and like just prepare for the zombie apocalypse. But then in the middle, this is where I advise people to be, be aware. You know, there, there may be a little bit of both. Who knows? Like you've got to have your hope everything's going to be okay. Which in many cases, it will be okay. And on the other side, some of this stuff is actually a possibility. So just being in the middle, being aware, diligent, and keeping up with what is actually happening around you is really useful right now. Okay. Now, prevention methods. What's things that you're recommending to you, the people that you're coming in contact, that you're educating? Mm -hmm. So I think every location is a little different right now. Every country is a little different right now. But in terms of social distancing, that's like across the board a necessity right now. Social distancing, looking at six feet away from other people. Um, in the case of someone being a vulnerable population or when in the case where you're starting to see cases multiply in your area, I recommend social isolation. And we are starting to see a little bit more of that conversation uh, here in California. And, um, so we are actually encouraged you know, to stay home as much as possible. You're only seeing up for uh, necessities, um, essential travel, or to get food, really, and the doctor or whatever. But, um, so doing all of those things, um, you know, hand sanitizer is great and all, but it's not a necessity. You can continue to use other types of cleaning materials. You know, you've got your other types of all-purpose cleaning sprays you can use. Um, lots of soap and water. Soap is much more effective. Um, studies are saying, and it makes total sense, washing it all off, washing your hands uh, frequently is uh, essential. They talk about the 20 seconds of, like, hand washing. Yeah. Um, hand washing. Um, what else? I think really for the most part, it's a lot of that social, I, at this point, social isolation is what we're doing. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dr. April. Uh, so, so I'm going to go to Monica. Uh, Monica is actually uh, an osteopathic manual practitioner that I'm familiar with because of my wife and you know just the, the expertise that she has in, in the field. Uh, so Monica, I, I have a question for you. Uh, for for the industry uh, being with uh, 
osteopaths and kind of dealing with different practitioners. You know, what are you kind of seeing in the industry? So I'm uh, both uh, an osteopathic manual practitioner, which is an unregulated profession here, and I'm a registered massage therapist, which is a regulated profession here. So we, um, and, uh, you know, I'm part of basically a very international community. So I, I am a administration for a group called Evidence-Based Osteopaths. Uh, Yes, that's what we're called. Um, and uh, evidence-based massage therapists uh, in, in one of those groups as well. So I have a, a, a very busy online community um, and an international community. So we're sort of seeing a lot of the kinds of things that are going on. In Ontario, there's, there is very much uh, a, an across-the-board um, we need to, to stay home and stop uh, all unnecessary um, treatments. Um, so that's been put out not only by all the registered uh, boards for PTs, chiros, massage therapists, but also by the association that I'm with for um, osteopathic practitioners. So uh, the recommendation has been uh, stop all practice, basically, unless it's, you know, emergency, which I think on a manual therapy level, we'd have a hard time uh, justifying what an emergency treatment would be. Um, but that one, okay. then that's yeah. a discussion that I'm starting to see online uh, from yeah. personal trainers to uh, nutritionists, all that, that I'm healthy. Why bother? Like I have to see my, my patients and my clients cause they need to see me. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they come into my office, you know, it's, it's a discussion online. What what I see mostly online is people who are encouraging um, people to shut down. So if someone is really waffling about it, and what I see with people who are waffling about it is that it's a really difficult decision because they're in a financial bind, um, but they're going to be in a financial bind either way. So if we didn't, if we put no measures in place, they would see their business disappear probably through sickness anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually it would happen, but it would be a much longer term problem that we'd end up having. Now what about liability? So, like, I think one thing they have to take into consideration, because I understand you've got the emotional, yeah. and this is my business. This is my bank account. I have maybe even practitioners underneath me. I have, I run a, like a full clinic, right. And yeah. I have to support yeah. them as well. The challenge that runs into is that, you know, the money and I, I get that as a business, but what about the actual due diligence, due care, you know, th that responsibility? We, as regulated professionals, we signed a contract basically to be members of our colleges who, and the college is not there for us. The colleges are there to take care of the public. That's part of their mandate. And they provide us with you know, the rules and regulations in order to do that. So when we joined up, we signed that contract to be a part of it. So so part of that decision is ethical, but we also have guidance from the colleges. And the colleges are saying, you know, we need to put this into practice. So it, it you know, it is an ethical decision. And if you look at uh, the ethical decisions, especially if you're dealing with also the financial situation, that can be a very hard thing. Um, to to come across and and because you're saying also okay people uh, don't have symptoms and they don't and they feel healthy and it's interesting because I've seen some uh, reactions from people who are older people um, so when people have shut their clinics down they're getting reactions from older people saying you know I'm that that they think this is this is being blown out of proportion and it's like hold on we're kind of doing this for you. <laughs> you know, that's part of it as well, a big part of it, because there is a large older population that's vulnerable, right? And we deal with, with um, we deal with people who have immune compromises and autoimmune diseases and all of those sorts of things. So we are one-on-one -on -one and we are touch-based therapies. We're physical therapies. We get in people's faces. There's absolutely no way that we can social distance and maintain our business at the same time. That's just the bottom line of it. So we have to actually take that into a place where we we need to we need to make those hard decisions. We need to take those financial hits. Now the government here is coming together and providing, you know, support, financial support for people who have to take those hits. And that's rolling out kind of as we right. speak. So Justin Trudeau spoke today. 
um, but that's rolling out as we speak. But part of, um, you know, part of the reactions I've seen online is that people uh, don't want to shut down because they, you know, they feel that they're healthy and their immune system will be fine. And, you know, and then you see some of that misinformation as well, where it's like, uh, you've seen that from, from, we've seen that a little bit with chiropractors where it's like, get an adjustment to help your immune system kind of thing. So all of that information also needs to be taken into account and, and that needs to be shut down along with the spread of the virus. Increase of market uh, leverage, right? And I, kind of that idea that, you know, you do this, you know, you come in for a massage therapist, you come from acupuncture, whatever that treatment may be, and mm -hmm. we can help you you know, through this process, through the COVID-19, which now is more of a marketing yeah. ploy versus actual, you know, proper health care. Well, I, th I, think in, I think in some of the industries, it's also a belief. It's also a belief that we would be able to help you boost your immune system or be better or be more well in this situation. Um, and the reality is we're not we're not seeing the reality of it. What we're seeing in numbers. So we see a lot of numbers, but we don't see people. We don't have names. We don't see faces. We don't understand how people's lives are being affected by this. So I think in some way, unlike say 9-11, which you can see the means of destruction and you can see what happened and, and, and you can see that, the, you know, how it affects people. This doesn't have that same impact in that same way. We don't have that sort of personal connection we do to each other but so far i haven't seen very much about how about who the people are who are dying and how those the, their families lives are being affected and what it means for us to stay home and actually stop this spread it's a larger social responsibility that we have not just to ourselves you know we as individuals we are probably going to be fine most of us like on a, on a numbers scale so what? That is not the right. point. The point is that there are people who are not going to be fine. And if we don't put these practices in place, we're going to find that out in a pretty big way. And uh, what they've already experienced mm -hmm. in their, you know, situation is still ongoing too, but we've seen how the numbers increase when they are trying to catch up, right? Because they were the kind of the first yeah. ones exposed to this. And now what happens as it started to increase, they're trying to implement strategies like on the fly. So now being in yeah. Canada and North America, like the United States, we've seen that. So now we can start implementing those strategies, but also continue implementing new strategies, new protocols, trying to lessen the impact of that. So like you're saying, yeah. it's the awareness and it's the difference between looking at, in my opinion, is looking at the business and financial aspect, the individual I, you know, it's all about me versus humanity. Mm -hmm. We're looking after everyone as yeah. a population. And I think it's really shining a light on that is that now it's the world's not about me. I don't get up. I don't go to work. I don't go to my car. I don't make my money. I don't go to this. And, I, and I, it's all about me, 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 me. And then whoever my next door neighbor is, they, let them deal with it by themselves. I don't care because I have to deal with it. Now it's like, hold on. We have this whole society. Now we have to think about, right? Because and we're all in the we're all in the same boat in terms of it being financial. Like like a lot of people in this in this industry, we rely on seeing people. That's how our business grows. We grow by seeing people one to one, face on face. So we have to shut that down. It has to be something that we need to take this impact of, and that's really really difficult. But the just on my street alone uh and it's a small street but we have an email stream and so we've we have now one going if anyone needs help like let us know and i'm seeing the same thing on social media where people are reaching out and saying let's let's get in contact like i'm not sure what to do like let's just talk about this how do we how you know what are the strategies we can put in place how can we help our patients maybe on a um a remote level you know with a with things that they might be worried about in terms of the pain that they're having. Um, so, so there are things that are happening, um, but it's such early days. So we're really just kind of swimming through this and trying to figure this out. But just from the social uh, media I've, uh, I've seen and the interactions I've had, yes, there are people out there who, who have misinformation, but they are they seem to be the minority most people are coming to this awareness of we need to make this decision not for ourselves but for our society and in canada 
in, in Ontario and in larger Canada, it seems that we have some cohesion around this and that the messages coming from both the province and um, just the, the feds, the feds and provincial and mayoral levels are, are similar. Right. Not exactly the same, but we have a lot of similarities, and there's a lot of there's a, a a lot of talk about this social cohesion as well. So, you know, hopefully that will continue. I'm not sure what that's going to look like on a day to day basis for the average RMT who can't now make money and can't make the rent. So we'll see what that looks like um, going forward. Now, any recommendations that you have as a practitioner at health, like what people should do? Well, one of the things, um, there are some people who put things on, uh, out to, to show people how to go online, um, how to maybe, uh, uh, you know, provide information online. Most of this is complimentary. It's not necessarily about making money. Um, and uh, just connecting with people. I mean, one of the things that, that uh, was, was out just recently was, um, and I, I can't remember who it was from, but we can go for a walk. We don't have to stay in our houses. We do need to stay away from people, but we have a, a, a country with a lot of space. So we can actually go for a walk. We can go for a walk in the woods. We can take that time out, give ourselves a break. I, I've been doing a lot of contacting with people that I haven't contacted for a while. We've been doing FaceTime. We've been chatting. We've been talking. My, my relatives in Australia, the right. same. So, so it, you know, it, it's now actually a time where we can actually have more contact with people and uh, perhaps a more meaningful contact with people as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to go on to Joseph. Hey, Joseph, how are you doing today? Great. How are you? Not bad. So Joseph, you're in the insurance industry. You're kind of looking at what's going on right across, you know, insurance, liability, business, as well as professional. What are you seeing? So first, let me just start off by saying that uh, the idea of flattening the curve in general, can yep. you hear me okay? Perfect. So the idea of flattening the curve is one that we've adopted in our office. So we have about 120 staff and, and salespeople uh, in the greater Toronto area, and we've essentially shut down the office um, to, to traffic coming in, to visitors, whether that be clients or potential clients. Um, and we've done this by, we're fortunate that over the past uh, year and a half, we've moved everyone over to laptops. So everyone literally has the capability of taking off their docking station, going remotely and clicking into their VPN and working as if nothing had changed. So we're really fortunate to have done that process about a year ago. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, the work continues. So we're still able to service clients, still able to, to deal with potential clients and offer quotes and those things. Uh, obviously, it's presented some challenges, uh, having everyone working from different areas. Um, we have limited staff at the office who need to be there. For instance, we get regular delivery of documents that then have to get scanned in a system. And then through our, our local our broker management system, everyone would then take from wherever they need it from in their own homes. So someone needs to be there to do that. So we have rotating schedule of doing that. Someone needs to be able to take in the mail every day. Someone needs to be able to send out the letters and they have to go out every day. So we're not quite the digital society we'd right. like to be. So, but, but I tell you, how, what we've done, though, is recognizing, one, that we have to do our part to flatten this curve. And we've recognized, number one, we've, and we've made this very clear to our staff, our salespeople, and to our clients, that first and foremost, this is something we all have to do. We all have a responsibility to, to be able to do this, whether you're a business owner, self-employed, working for someone else, whatever we can do our part, we have to do that. And we took that seriously. So we explained to them and going back to everyone else's points that the vast majority of people, some 80% is the statistic they use continuously on CNN. 80% of people continue to feel mild symptoms. Right. So when you get this, they're mild symptoms. So I think we have to take the myths away from, if you get this, it's not an automatic death sentence. So Let's be clear, the reason why we're doing this isn't to stop the virus in its tracks, it's to slow down the spread of the virus. So we, we were very clear to our staff and to our clients why we're doing this. This is about really three things. It's about helping the community at large, making sure that whatever we can do to slow down the spread means the people who do get it and have the serious symptoms are gonna get the support they need in the hospital system. And doing nothing wasn't gonna help anyone and was actually gonna do a disservice to people who uh, really 
wouldn't normally need those types of services, but because you can't get regular service, you might be put into the danger category. Second, it was about protecting our staff and their families. We're very clear to everyone, including our clients, that making sure that we did our best to isolate our staff from everyone else, potential visitors and all that stuff, was also about their own safety and the safety of their family members. They all go home to someone who's elderly, to someone who's already has a compromised immune system. So that was about supporting them right. directly. And third, it was about supporting their clients. And this one takes a bit of understanding that if we did nothing, there would be a situation at some point in time where we would have to shut down the office and no one would be working from home. No one would be able to be working because either they had their own self quarantine where they may not have, have had access to the system that we need to use. And there would be no one at the office because we'd have to shut it down. So this was all about having a continuity plan to protect the community, our staff, their families, and our clients as well. So it's a big effort, again, not without its challenges, but it's something we did uh, back on Friday. So we, we really implemented this. Um, another note, as, a, as president of the Association of Insurance Brokers of Ontario, so representing approximately 15,000 people, insurance brokers and their staff across Ontario, uh, we've been given the same message about uh, you need to do what you can to support all these, these people. And brokers have, by and large, followed suit. Um, they've done all these things where, we're, you know, some of the challenges as we continue to talk to all of our brokers across Ontario, what are the best practices? What are some of the issues that we're dealing with just operating, never mind dealing with questions from clients, but what can we do to better operate, better communicate with our staff, make sure that we have uh, all the systems in place to have some semblance of reality of how we're supposed to operate as a business. Um, but to your specific point, though, and I just yep. felt I needed to describe that For scenario. Sure. Um, as far as clients, though, I think that by and large, it's um, there's a there's a panic mm -hmm. out there, right? There's a panic that uh, I've never seen a situation where the phones don't ring um, and clients don't email and call. And I think the first few days, pretty much from Thursday, Friday till till now, has been this sense of oh my God, what do I have to do? I need my supplies. I need to make sure our family's safe. And I think they'll get into these other types of insurance questions as time okay. goes on. We have been getting some of those questions from, from companies, from businesses. And you can imagine, um, for instance, there's this impression out there that if you're a small business owner and you have a business insurance policy and you're shut down, and if you have business interruption insurance, well, that your business has been interrupted, therefore you have coverage on your right. policy. Um, and, and it's unfortunate, but I mean, by and large, the, the simple basis of what triggers that business interruption insurance is not because you just closed right. down. Uh, there needs to be generally their physical damage related. So for instance, if a fire happened to your business and you had to shut down because of that, then if you had business interruption insurance, you would continue to get your key personnel paid, your, your profit that you would have made during that time paid, any expenses you would have had. For instance, continuing to lease, pay your lease, continuing to pay lease on equipment, all these types of things. Um, when you don't have bodily injury or property damage as a result of this scenario, it really doesn't trigger. Okay. You could have a, a, an authority like a municipality or a province declaring a state of emergency and forcibly shutting down your business. That still doesn't trigger this coverage because most, the vast majority of these policies, so the the IBC, which is the Insurance Bureau of Canada wording, which is the standard wording most insurance companies have, actually state that uh, pandemics or uh, disease or any type of um, um, situation where there is a pandemic essentially is an exclusion on these okay. policies. So very rarely would someone have that coverage available. So I think first and foremost, slowly as businesses call in, they're starting to get these messages and realize, oh, it's not what they thought. Um, and I think, and not that they were led to believe that when they were sold the policy, I think more on television, on radio, on the internet, people are just saying, we'll just call your insurance broker and just have them, you know, give you, start a claim and get right. paid. So it's not that simple. Um, so it's not that there's any deliberate misinformation being spread, but I think people naturally just say, we'll just call your broker and, and get your coverage there type of thing. Um, I think in watching today's announcement uh, from the, the prime minister of Canada, finance minister um, just recently, um, you know, there's certainly a huge package. You're talking about half a, you know, $55 billion 
82 billion, like the amounts of numbers are throwing out there to provide um, income for people who were all of a sudden sent home. So they were said, look, we're, our restaurants closed. We've got no more work for you. You're going to go home. Um, and, you know, it would take, for instance, a week to get EI insurance, employment insurance in that particular situation, right. Ontario. They've waived yeah. that. They've waived that. If you're home and you don't have the income um, and you weren't working in the previous time, maybe you were in school, but you have bills to pay, you have rent to pay, you have a mortgage to pay. Um, they've now issued um, measures. So uh, by early April, you'll be able to collect a certain amount of money, sort of employment insurance like product, but not necessarily based on that. So I think many of these measures, both provincial and federal governments will step in and provide support. I mean, one thing we need to understand is this is a life changing, life altering event. This is something our economy or, or our finances from a federal and provincial level will not be able to, to come back from in any short right. order. Uh, this, this, this is a huge event. We're all going to be impacted by this, but I think the message has to be very clear. We're all in this together. It's not that a segment of society is going to be out in the cold and everyone else is going to be covered. We're all going to go through this together. There's, there's going to be equality in how we're treated. Um, I think, for instance, banks and mortgages have now said they have a six month uh, uh, waiving your, your, uh, your mortgage, your payment mortgage payments. Are- we'll get more details. Yeah. 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 But as well, what we've asked as an association to the insurance companies that we represent is so we know this is going to happen very shortly clients won't be able to make their monthly withdrawals out of the bank for their car policies, home policies, business mm-hmm. policies. They may not be able to make their, their other contributions, whatever they're doing. So what is going to be their strategy when it comes to forgiving? Um, are they going to, we've asked questions like, will you at least waive the NSF fees to begin with when someone does have that situation? Will you allow them to catch up at some point in the near future? What is that going to look like? Um, you can see very quickly that if none of these things happen and people are home and they have no money coming into the bank account and their auto insurance and their home insurance is going through their bank every month uh, and there's no money there to take those payments, we don't want to have a situation where consumers are, are stuck without having any auto insurance or home insurance or business insurance and the ramifications of something should something occur during that time. So unfortunately, we're still in the early stages of this and not having all the answers. But what I can say is we have a lot of people working on trying to get these answers. We have a lot of people working on what's best for everyone involved. So, um, you know, again, we're all in this together. Uh, No one's going to force anyone to do anything today. Uh, We're certainly going to work together as a community to find, to find solutions for this. And we're committed as an association to do that. And obviously as, as for our brokerage and our clients, we're doing our best for their interests as well. Um, and we're also, I mean, it's, it's a balancing act. We're doing our best for our staff, our best for their families and our best for our clients. There's a lot of, of, uh, goodwill out there. There's a lot of effort to try to make this work. A lot of these things, like many of the people on our panel today, we don't have full control over the end result of this. It's a lot of government action. It's a lot of, of, uh, huge companies, whether it's banks or, or insurance companies involved. So I think it's a wait and see for now, but as far as us getting out there and pushing what it is we need for our clients. We're doing that on a daily basis. Um, and we try to, again, it's been fairly quiet on the, the insured uh, side. We don't get a lot of calls. I, I think they're still just trying to settle down and, and get into a routine. The calls will come and they'll come <laughs> pretty quickly. And they'll come as soon as someone's trying to get into the bank to, to tap a withdrawal. I mean, clearly um, that's going to be where the, the biggest decisions come and businesses that are, that are closed. They're going to want to know what rights they have on their policy. And again, those calls are slowly, slowly starting to trickle in. And we're trying to resolve that not on a one-off basis, but in a very large communicative style. So as an association and with insurance companies, we're trying to say, okay, let's try to get the answers to the really big questions out there for the public. That way we're not inundated by this because again, because we have our staff working at home, we're limited in our ability to respond in our normal pace of work. So, these are all they, said, right they certainly have been responding, though. We've been we've already been informed of the the um, interruption insurance that basically, as as people who are personally insured, that doesn't count for pandemics. So our companies have sort of sent out blanket statements around that. I think probably to stem some of the calls I've had. Yeah, I, I would imagine absolutely. So 
I mean, it, it continues. Uh, we're I, I'm on about three calls a day with our association CEO, uh, just trying to field all the questions we have coming in from our members, our broker members, about some of the questions they're getting. And we're doing our best to put out podcasts, uh, videos, information sheets, whatever we can to then our community and then broadcast that out to the broader community of clients and people across Ontario and Canada, really. Uh, so it's an ongoing battle. Wow. No, it's th thank you, Joseph. Now I'm going to go to, to Drew. Uh, Drew, you're the financial advisor in the United States. I'd uh, love to hear kind of what you're seeing, what you're seeing in the industry. Sure. Well, first, uh, I want to thank everybody for taking time out. I think this is kind of a well-needed podcast uh, video here. And so I guess from, from my side, what I'm seeing is um, I think a lot of people have learned through history as to not to get too wound up here uh, with the financial piece. Yes, there's going to be problems. We know that. There already are some issues in some households. Um, but I think that it's important to kind of address what Monica was speaking to earlier. There's a lot of small businesses out there that are... Uh, they're not ready to pull the trigger as far as stepping out of the business because they're so concerned about what the financial ramification of that is. And so I would encourage those individuals to look into, uh, here in the States, we have our SBA, it's called the Small Business Administration, and they're offering loan programs specifically to businesses that are going to end up in a potential situation where they're going to have to let people go or you know they may be facing challenges with paying their overhead. So I think that that's a, a fair place to start for somebody if they do not have the resources set aside to weather uh, a storm like this. Um, also, and then to go a step further, for people that are listening that are concerned about income and they were an employee that may have um, been asked to go home because either uh, they currently contracted the virus, uh, they have been around somebody that has tested positive, or they're just simply asked to uh, self-quarantine after travel. Here in the States, and I double-checked as well as in Canada as well, and it looks like Quebec had uh, a similar offering for temporary assistance or temporary aid, I should say, in Quebec. And what this does here in New York State specifically is they're encouraging people to go online and apply for unemployment benefits, either go online or make a phone call. And kind of the numbers here, um, they really made a push on Monday and, and it's working. Here, here's why we know that it's working because on Monday, 78,000 individuals called in or went online to apply for benefits. Now on Tuesday, and this comes from a director head at New York State Unemployment, Tuesday, ready? 10 o'clock in the morning, they had 41,000 phone calls that have already come in. They had 110 individuals go online. So we know that that message is resonating with people. And now they've kind of have put in place an alphabetical approach, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, depending upon the first letter of your last name. So I would encourage people to go ahead and see what type of assistance is available for you in your province or in your state because they're waiving, uh, in most cases, they're waiving the elimination period. So you're going to be able to collect benefits immediately. So I think that kind of speaks to the here and now and um, what can small businesses do, what can individuals do that have since been uh, you know, not able to show up to work or may not be able to provide. Um, and we spoke offline earlier this morning, kind of talking about, well, what are, what are some other issues um, that people are saying? And you had made mention of, you know, the, the market's doing what the market does. And, uh, you know, right now, that may not be the most relevant matter for some families. And so we said, what would be something that, that they could do if someone is sitting home and they've got a knot in their stomach because they're looking at their beautiful family and they're thinking, I don't exactly know what to do at this time. You know, there's only so much money and we, we may run out of money before we run out a month. 
So with those individuals, I would encourage you to make sure that if you haven't done this already, that you create a spreadsheet for yourself and make sure that you understand what your household budget is, okay? This may be a very good time to have a real conversation and kind of get in the weeds. Um, certainly not encouraging any uh, marital discourse through this, of course. You know, number one thing is we want to come through this as a stronger family. Um, and so what I would say is if... If you have a subscription to Hulu and Netflix and DirecTV, well, it may be time to whittle that down to one. Well, right? let's, let's if put you that have in a context, monthly, right? Because yeah. I, I think what we were talking okay. about is, you know, if people don't have the financial means and they haven't saved up for, you know, and we talked about like the financial books and everything that we read to have at least six months salary behind you up to one year in Perfect. case of an, an incident that happens that at least you have a little bit of safety measure that you're not in a panic. You're not living paycheck to paycheck or month to month, but that you have, you have a little right. bit of a float that, okay, something happened. I can breathe. I can pay my bills. I can pay my mortgage. I can pay my insurance. I can put food on the table. I can cover all my costs. And what we said is that there's a big percentage are not at that point, right? That are now going, oh my God, it's two weeks in. What am I going to do? I don't have money coming in. And now the bills are starting to pay up and I don't have reserves or very little that 30 days to 90 days, I'm going to be broke. And now I'm going to need you know help. So now we're seeing that panic. And this is the great discussion that you're talking about is, you know, reevaluating kind of your, 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 your profit and loss, your kind of your household expenses and kind of looking at, well, how much money is coming in and what are essential services, essential needs and what are fun? You know, like mm. if you have Disney plus Hulu, you know, Netflix, you know, uh, Amazon prime, maybe you don't need all those right now. Right. And, and right. we had, we That's were right. joking around a little bit. Maybe you don't need those all. Maybe you should start going to read a bit, you know, grab a book. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Leaders are readers. So, uh, reading is never out of uh, vogue. Right. So, uh, so uh, yeah, absolutely. Let's, I think we, this is a phenomenal opportunity, quite frankly, in my opinion, um, as far as it almost gives us a reset globally, uh, a reset financially because it's really challenging us to examine our habits, right? Examine our plans as we had talked about. Um, you know, there, it may be too little too late for some families financially at this time, but I think we can use this as a phenomenal opportunity to create a new foundation with how you'll move forward and how you can be better prepared in the event that a situation like this comes up. And we know, I mean, you know, in the, uh, the four decades that, that I've been here, you know, there's been several events and, um, you know, although we may not be prepared today, let's prepare for the next one. I would encourage people on that. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, the other thing is for those that are, uh, fortunate enough to, to be invested and to have some savings in place, um, you, you're not in this alone. Okay, we're all in this together. And what I would uh, like to speak to those individuals that are invested is, if you're curious as to what to do at this time, you know, this is not the time to go and throw the baby out with the bathwater. Okay, the moment that individuals sell their positions, they're going to create a loss. Now, if you stay in the saddle, there should be a reward for you long term. So what I think is the most prudent uh, move at this time is to meet with your financial advisor and update what we call your investor profile. Let's just make sure that you can tolerate the risk that you once told us that you could and uh, just see if your conviction is real. And this is a good time to do that because you're really being tested. So if you need to make a change, uh, don't be too proud to make a change, right? Make the change as necessary and... Um, you know, just believe in your long-term goals and make sure that you follow your plan because, uh, you know, as we say, the market does two things for sure, right? It gives and it takes away. So if you keep your eyes on your long-term goal, uh, we'll be able to make the appropriate moves for you in the future. And I think that leads to one of the, the comments I was saying online is there's kind of this bull and bear market, Right. Right. When it's a bear market, you hear in the strategy books and all that, that you should purchase now and you kind of really getting invested. And when it's a bull market, kind of slow down because, you know, the things prices are high. Right. But when it's a bear market, too, because we don't know the, the effect of this pandemic, go slow. 
right? You know, be strategic. Don't kind of put all your eggs in one basket and say, you know, I'm going to buy Amazon stock because they're low now. I'm going to buy that now because once it comes out of it, I'm going to be rich. And then all of a sudden you can't That's sustain right. your life, right? You know, things That's right, are, right. You know, kind of leeway that you can do that. Just go slow, like, because we don't know how long this is going to be, right? They're estimating. Right. And we're all hoping that the conversations, we're hoping that people are doing the right things to help this pandemic to slow down and then start to fizzle off. And then we start to recover. That's what we're all hoping. But we just don't know. Is it two weeks? Is it two months? And we don't we don't we, we don't know what the bottom is. Um, you know, the market has been testing uh, in the States here, the Dow Jones at uh, 20,000 as kind of uh, the bottom of this. And it's kind of ebbed and flowed past that uh, throughout the day here. But uh to, to speak to that as far as, you know, have a systematic approach. Well, what we call this is dollar cost averaging. So if you have a plan to continue to add money into your investment accounts, continue to do that. Um, don't, don't be a fear-based individual as we've kind of been talking about. You know, someplace in the middle, I believe um, that it was uh, Monica or April had said, um, you know, we don't want to be so fearful, and I think it was April said, we don't want to be so fearful that we don't do anything, but we also don't want to uh, put our head in the sand either, right? We need to live in somewhere in the middle there. And, um, and the same holds true with investing or financial. So if you continue to have a strategy to put money away, that's going to give you the ability to be able to purchase at lower points through the market and higher points through the market. And it'll average out to a better average uh, investing uh, for you over long so, term, right? Um, yeah, just, just, that's right. Exactly right. So just don't lose the faith and trust in the process. Um, they always like they say this too will right. pass. And and I think that's kind of what we're getting across the board. And I want to open this up to kind of the whole panel is, you know, what, what are your thoughts on what's going on in the media, not just from our government, but from the news itself, right? And how it relates to our population. And I'll put in context for myself is I'm seeing a lot of kind of fear based media. And I've talked to, you know, some of you guys offline is that, you know, you see these, you know, kind of headlines to sizzle and to catch, you know, first baby in Ontario gets the, the coronavirus, you know, what are we going to do? Like, and all this stuff to get people in, in a fear state. And I want to love to hear your guys' opinion, because my opinion on this is that we got to settle that down. Because I think it's putting people into a fear state versus into a logical concern, right? And the logical concern where they go, okay, that's understandable. Here's some actions I need to take versus a fear state where we're seeing that, oh my God, I got to go buy out like, you know, all the toilet paper. I got to buy out all the water, hand sanitizers, get five buckets of them. You know, I was talking to two nurses today and they're saying that people are actually going to the hospital with mason jars, cleaning out the hand sanitizers. Like, you know. I think the media needs to start to, you know, settle down and give factual information and relevant information to help people move forward versus putting in the fear state. And I'd love to hear what you guys think. Well, from my perspective, I'm uh, paranoid all the time. Like I walk out the door and wonder whether or not my outfit is an end appropriate end of the world outfit and I can run in it. But um, I, we got kind of paranoid with, um, with Wuhan. And uh, we did a COVID shop way before uh, anyone else did. So we have like, you know, we have a supply for if we needed to actually live the basics, you know, kind of thing, if we needed to sort of settle. So I can understand where some of that fear-based uh, thing comes from. Um, but part of it also is what is talking about the supply chain. It's kind of like if we don't have a supply chain, what is that going to mean for people, which is one of those things where people are like, oh, we have to go out and get these things. We just did that because we, we knew we, I, I knew we were probably going to be home and we'd need to have some supplies. So, but it was, it, but then it comes out afterwards with the supply chain. Um, so people are worried that they won't be able to get the necessities that they need if they're in a situation like shut down in Italy or something like right. that. So it's certainly understandable. I think that that seems to be something that if the supplies keep coming, if we keep seeing pictures of people, of the stores restocking and we had the toilet paper company come out and say, it's fine, we have enough, it'll be fine, we've got production underway, um, that kind of takes away a little bit of that. 
Um, but I wanted to just go back quickly just to a point that Drew said where he said, you know, this is a reset, like a financial reset and, and things like that. And I'm thinking about people who don't have the ability to, um, you know, strategize in the way you're talking about in terms of an investment. And they're basically living paycheck to paycheck. And the government um, thing, policies that are coming out and the, and, and the packages that are coming out and, you know, the next part of this social sort of experiment that we're in is that people, is, is that, if we're reevaluating what it looks like to have a particular amount of finances or to have a particular goals in our life, those people who have the ability to, to maintain their investment or to keep doing what they need to do shouldn't be the people that go for these packages that, uh, 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 that are being offered to people who are in need. And I think that that is going to be our next step in this sort of um, you know, social thing where if, if you can afford it, don't be going out for the for the money that is being offered so that people who can't afford it are the ones that, and, and the people who are in need are the ones that get them. Right. And I, and I get what you're saying is that, you know, the wealthy and the top 5% shouldn't be going for social assistance and unemployment, right? It's the ones that like yeah. maybe... Because we're trying to maintain. It's like, oh, my God, now we're losing all of what we had. And so how do we get that back again? And it's like, no, we still have... And enough. Do you know what I mean? We still have enough to get us through. So that was my only thought when, when Drew yeah, was no, I agree with that. And I think that's a, a good point to bring up is that, you know, and that comes down to us too, being socially responsible. Because I mean, for myself, I've got mm -hmm. one year of, of savings behind me that I'm fine if this happens, you know, and goes for long for one year. Because I plan like that. Mm -hmm. I read enough financial books to know that in any case, if I got sick or something happened, to have that behind me, minimum six months, one year salary behind you, just in case, right? And that was a financial strategy that you start to you know, implement. If you're an, you're an entrepreneur, you're, you own your own business, you think of those things because what if your business has a hard year? What do you do, right? Mm -hmm. These are the things that you have to think about. And for me, I shouldn't go and I wouldn't do this, go to that kind of service because I don't need it. And I think that's something you're saying is that social responsibility is that on us, we need to take that and say, look, John next door, he's got kids, he's struggling, he's out of work. Yeah, he's paycheck he, to paycheck. He needs that. You know, he needs exactly. the money. And we have to be yeah. more mindful of that too. I mean, like, and that gives that 50-50 that handshake where there ha should be an assessment going through, but also people should have the social responsibility to say, yeah, I don't need that. You know, maybe in a year, if it goes on for a year and a half, knock on wood, mm -hmm. it, it won't. But then, yeah, then at that time, if I have to go for it. But I think you make a good point. So what do you guys, again, going back to the media question, what is Joseph, Drew, Dr. April, what do you guys think? So I'm happy to respond to that. I think um, part of the, the I, I want to call it fear mongering, but part of that, that idea of what the media is saying and people fear that they're, or, or feel that they're being put into a position where they have to be afraid and fear for everything. Um, I think this is the problem when you're trying to appeal to a huge segment of society that all have different viewpoints. So I think there's a good number of people who just take the attitude, okay, fine, I'm gonna do my part and I'm gonna stay home and I'm gonna do this. Um, so I live across from a, a Cineplex theater, so a huge movie theater over here in, uh, in Vaughan actually. And, um, I can't tell you how packed that that theater was for the past three nights <laughs> prior to them closing right. it. And so, and so there you would see, so, so when we go back to the fear monitoring is, is, but you still have a segment of society, generally a younger group that doesn't seem to think, well, it's not really going to impact me. They, they don't, I think the problem here is they don't understand their role and how this is going to make them um, have an impact on people who right. can't deal with it. So I, so when, you know, I like, I don't remember the doctor's name, but he made this comment. He said, you just have to behave as if you have this virus. And how would you behave knowing that you have this virus? Well, you would stay away from other people. Okay. Assume you have it and live like that for the next right. little while. Uh, but, you know, you've got young people who generally, I'm just generalizing, young people who think, well, it's not going to harm me. Uh, but then they go home and they visit with their parents or their grandparents and they don't understand that. If you don't have, so the vast majority of people have had very light right. symptoms. Uh, and many people for days, they're, they're coming out now and saying that for days, you can, you can be asymptomatic but have the virus. And you could be unknowingly passing this off to a whole bunch of people. So the idea of flattening the curve 
only works if people actually help flatten the curve. Otherwise, um, people will say, well, wow, there's such a spike in how many people have it. It overwhelmed the, the medical system, overwhelmed the hospitals. As a result, so many people died. You don't have to go too far to see what the effects of that is. Go to Italy. Like There are tons of stories coming out of Italy of saying that had we understood how serious this was, we would have behaved right. differently consistently no one in italy is saying today i wish they wouldn't have talked to us like they were fear-mongering i wish they would have talked to us like this was really nothing nothing right. too bad no one is saying that so it tells you that people who are going through this right now i mean they have like mind you they have a six and a half percent death rate right. in italy right they are literally in a system where they've shut down every city every town and said there's no movement back and forth so if you want to leave and go to the drugstore because you run out of supplies or you want to go to the grocery store, you have to print off a form. Uh, you have to complete what it is you're doing. And all along the way, you're going to get pulled over and asked, okay, where are you going? Show me your form. And if they see that you're deviating from that, you're actually are going to get right. jailed. You're going to get fined. So they're, like the stories coming out of Italy are the fact that this is serious. They're, they wish they had taken it more serious. So. I'm not so to your point, I'm not too concerned about people complaining that they're fear mongering or the media is fear mongering. I think they need to take the, the right approach, which is people have to understand the consequence of this. If people don't want to take it seriously, then they're not going to take it seriously. They're going to the ones complaining are the ones generally who aren't taking it seriously. Right. And 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 history, not that long ago, a week ago, in other countries in Europe are saying we wish we had taken it more seriously. The people who were saying this is nothing. A week later saying, oh, my God, I wish I right. had known. So I, I'm not too concerned about that. I, I know that there's this big perception that they're fear mongering. And I think they're they're doing the public service of making sure that people understand this is what you have to do to make this. So it's not worse than what it, it's going to be, right. hopefully. So um, now uh, the we all have a role to play. We all have a role to play in that. And I, I'm not personally too concerned that they're they're fear mongering. I think they have to make sure people understand the consequences and and it's really up to government at that point to step in whether it's shelter in place in the u.s or it's it's a um, an, an act here or a um basically a measure to say no everyone's indoors no coming out there's going to be a curfew i suspect at some point uh, i think these things need to happen right. we're not talking about for a year's time we're talking about potentially weeks or months and i don't think it's the end of the world we just need to do it take our medicine and just do what we have well to in do. context of that Right. And I think what my concern is, is that it's not the point of the information going out there. And yes, there's a little bit of fear based. It's how it's being propagated by someone online that now it's taking and grabbing it and now sharing out their their community, not understanding the impact of that. Right. And how it's going to you know affect them, because in my opinion, and I don't know, like and this would be great to hear you guys feedback before the coronavirus, before COVID-19. Certain people in the in our environment were carrying a lot of stress, financial stress, emotional stress. And then when you put on this, the, the capacity for them to handle this information, it, it can overwhelm them. And then they start to react and they start to get more stressed and don't know what to do and panic versus the ones that, like you're saying, more that are grounded. OK, these are the numbers. Oh, it's concerning. OK, I have a family member. I have kids. I have that. It's concerning. What do I need to do versus, oh, my God, the house is on fire. The house is on fire. Right. And then putting them in, a, like, as we know, the primal, you know, fear patterns is fight, flight, or freeze, right? So now they go on this, and then now they're they're fighting online. Why are they fighting? They don't know. They're just fighting. They need to fight. I'm, I'm going to, I need my freedoms. Why are you taking my freedoms away? I'm going to work because I need to work, right? Or they're, they're flighting, which we're seeing is that I'm not going to do anything. No one's going to control me. You know, I'm just going to just do my own thing. I'm done, you know. The government can do that. They're all scaring me. So we're kind of seeing that side. And I think that comes down to we've put them into that. They're already maybe potentially in that level of fear. And now we've escalated that. And I'm, they're more reacting. And I'm seeing this more online. And I think that's, you know, again, one of the premises for this conversation is to give people really true, good information, factual information, and then strategies of kind of what you need to do. Right. And great resources. Right. Don't go on social media thinking, Bob, your cousin who is posting stuff online and, you know, you need to get gas masking. You need to do this right now is the best resource. You know, your news, your World Health Organization, you know, WHO. Those are the best resources. If you need to know information, go to these resources. Don't 
you know, cousin Bob who's got a bomb shelter, you know, and now is hunkering down because it's the end of days and he's watched the zombie apocalypse, he might not be the best resource, right? And that's my concern I'm seeing more and more is you're seeing more of these posts. And I'm seeing it like in my community is that they're putting out this, you know, it's going on for like eight months. I'm not going to have a house. I'm not going to lose my, I'm going to lose my job. So I think that's my, more my concern and talking to you guys and helping to educate what it needs to be done is, is going to help. Well, I think I'm seeing online that at least in the communities that I'm in, that there's more people who are providing um, evidence-based information as much as we have with the virus um, for those people who are presenting, who are fearful or who have misinformation, we're kind of shutting it down depending on the group that we're in. And so I think you can probably find groups that um, uh, don't do that as much, but certainly in the communities that I'm in, that is our right. goal. And most of us have that, you know, we, we kind of, you know, there might sometimes be a bit of a pile on, but, it, you know, basically we're trying to get the information out that needs to get out there in the right way. And I think that that's part of the community thing as well. So if we can keep doing that, that may start to help. And people are asking, people are saying, what are you doing? What, what, what are the sorts of things I can do? People are reaching out for assistance. And I'm seeing those questions online because we have that community. And so it's a really, it's actually been quite, um, quite good to see. That's good. Drew, what do you, what do you think? Well, I, I had a question for April, if, if I could, um, you know, my, my take is as watching media and various sources that, um, you know, we show up from home after work and we see all of our local personalities always speaking almost as though they're professionals in different fields. And, um, and, and I think there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there. And I was wondering if April could suggest a good uh, source of information on the medical side that kind of speaks to us as laymen uh, to know what what is worthwhile to consider through this all and what's just noise. Because, um, and I'm sure you've experienced this as well, but uh, I think that some of the hysteria uh, that people are experiencing is coming from, you know, mom calling during the day or an aunt said this or an uncle got an email about that, right? So um, I guess what's a good way for us to fact check, if you would, Dr. April? That's a great question. In terms of finding the correct news, I like to think of it in terms of information, misinformation, and missing information. So I have a lot to say about this, and I love the fact that you asked this question. So, you know, we, our first resort is the news, finding out information from places like, you know, all these news channels and finding out what's happening locally, nationally, and these press releases or public releases that these um, public health information officers are sharing out with us. And um, so that actually kind of begins like this process of like, what the heck? Okay, so in some cases, there's a lot of missing information. So we've already seen in the World Health Organization, you can look at government sites, so I should mention also organizational sites, uh, such as the World, World Health Organization, because of the fact that they have the bigger picture, they have the more bird's eye view of what's actually been going on around the world. And in the other countries, in our countries, we may not have that insight yet. And so breaking it down even more into like local government, oh my gosh, it takes so long for them to respond to such things. So we saw from months and months ago that this was going to become an epidemic and now a pandemic around the world. And that response took forever. We are now in this situation that could have been so much better controlled. And it bothers me so much because of the fact that just two weeks ago, we were starting to see cases here because of travel. And I don't know if you remember, there was so much conversation about travel related uh, contraction of being contracted travel related issues of being of contracting this illness. And so they were so stuck on that. And it bothers me so much because of the fact that we knew it was contagious, but they were not talking about community transmission yet. 
and people were still meeting and gathering. My yoga studio was still meeting. And I was getting so upset because of the fact that I am part of that vulnerable population and they were continuing to gather. I was losing points for not showing up to my classes, my teacher training, and they were still gathering because there was less enforcement at the local level of this, the known fact that this was contagious. And even worse was that at the county level, we were still seeing these accounts. Okay, so now it's actually reaching my county. There are counts of cases now in my county. However, the local officials in my county were still saying that community interaction was still very, very safe. There was a very, very low risk of community transmission. It angered me so much to hear that. This was just like about two weeks ago. And I could not believe what I was hearing. Knowing about the nature of this condition, this disease, and how infectious it is, and how it affects people like me more so as part of that immunocompromised vulnerable population, I was just really upset. And these are public health people. And they were sharing this information that was actually not correct. And so anyways, going further, as you mentioned, in terms of how to get more information, so listening to the news, um, finding out what they're saying, I mean, really, we have to, I mean, if that's the information we're given, you know, so most of us are just going to have to accept it. There are some of us who are going to be able to question it, but for the most part, and it's good to question. I think it's good to question. Um, also, these websites such as your local, your city, your state, your county level public health organization's website to get updates. If you're so, if you're interested to find out how many people have been reported to have this this uh, this virus, how many cases there are, how much incidence there is in your vicinity, if you're interested in hearing all that data, it's out there. And and the other thing is that missing information is also a huge issue. So in the United States, we have people who cannot get tested. So when we, get, when we get the number of cases, this is a small fraction of what's really going on because most people can't access testing. So it's just like, how are we going to get these numbers? How are we really going to understand what's going on, except to understand the fact that this is probably worse than you think it is. And um, the other place I really love to get information is from Twitter. And this is kind of maybe like I don't want to say more advanced level, but it's like if you really want to, you know, delve further into what's going on around the world or locally, get those firsthand accounts from Twitter. You can actually connect to ER doctors, emergency room doctors, and hear their personal accounts of treating people with COVID-19. These stories don't often make the news. And it's so fascinating to hear firsthand, knowing that these people, you know, they actually have their credentials. If their name is on it, you can verify, you can go on the website and make sure this person really exists uh, at their hospital. And they say, I am a hospitalist. I am an emergency room doctor. I am a, a respiratory therapist at this facility. And, you know, they're sharing information in real time. They're sharing articles, publications. Um, epidemiologists are sharing counts of projections of what they're seeing in this country, other countries around the world, and the likelihood of how bad or how much this is going to spread, and also sharing those accounts, oh my goodness, of people of all ages, people with specific disease conditions even, and hearing stories about how they're doing once you know they've contracted this virus. How are they doing in the hospitals? Hearing that information firsthand, is available on Twitter. Sometimes you can get information that the news reports like two hours later from Twitter. So I love Twitter and just verify, you know, um, verify that information, look at the source of who's saying what, if this is a well-known public official or executive at a hospital and they're sharing this information, this is gold. This is so much more valuable than the news in my opinion. And then the other thing in terms of like the lay public and being able to translate a lot of information from the science into just truly understanding what's going on with COVID. I have a podcast that I'm working on. It's called COVID-19 Public, public Health Policy and Culture. COVID-19 PPC is the name of my upcoming podcast. I'm interviewing people firsthand living in 
quarantine, self-quarantine or isolation, social distancing from Italy, China, Spain, around the world. People who are living firsthand with this uh, epidemic, pandemic in different locations, hearing their personal stories, also critiquing different articles, research. Um, FYI, research can still be critiqued. Uh, the science is never uh, completely objective. So we question all of that as well. We have these conversations about public health policy and culture. And asking people who have higher health literacy than you do. So part of it is that, that a lay person ha may have lower health literacy in what they're reading. And so to be able to connect with someone who has a higher health literacy with regard to that information and can explain it to you can be helpful as well. For sure. And they can explain mm -hmm. it to you in context, right? Right. I mean, kind of both the good and the yeah. bad of it, the statistics and what it means and in just a global scale it and all, like all that versus yeah. exactly. Right. No, I, and I totally agree with that. No, for sure. And, and just to kind of recap, maybe we uh, did you guys in here that uh, April, Dr. April has actually a podcast. She's actually working on this specific thing about information and the people that she's interviewing. So uh, thank you. That's great that you're able to get that information and help educate people. So one last question I have for you guys. So kind of, we kind of, dig deep on the COVID virus, what's going on, you know, kind of each of the areas of the specialties that you guys have and kind of the society, what's next? What should we be, uh, people be looking at? What should people be doing, you know, starting today, moving forward? Well, that's a tough one because <laughs> it's just, it's emerging <laughs> uh, to way too quickly, right. I think in some ways. Um, yeah, hard to know. I think part of it, if, if you're talking about, um, People being able to cope is perhaps in this time focusing a little bit on themselves and a little bit on wellness um, for themselves to de-stress, to go for a walk, to connect with people, to uh, you know put as many resources in place as you can on a on a on a community level uh, would be one thing that may be helpful in terms of the finances. That's not where I am. So. <laughs> that's not my that's not my chance. <laughs> I will help translate health information. Th there you go. Perfect. <laughs> J Joseph? Sure. I think by early next week, um, I, I, just the way the numbers will move as they've moved in other countries, I think um, anyone who was maybe doubting the severity of the situation may, may come to a find Jesus moment. I'm not really sure. But, um, but I think generally as a society, I think we're going to have to focus in supporting emotionally, mentally, um, all of our fellow citizens in our community online over the phone in any way possible, because that face-to-face -face interaction is not going to happen in person. Mm. And I think, uh, as you see in other, in other countries, they're doing this. And I think the next step is, okay, so very much that you have this, this session on zoom is okay. So I can see, um, hangouts, Google hangouts. I can see other zoom type of things for people in particular communities saying, look, who wants to talk just to chat, just to talk about what's going on, supporting each other. How are you finding this? What can I do to support you here? Uh, and I think that's really where this is going to go, just based on all the other experiences of the other countries. And I suspect that'll start to happen as people kind of settle into the fact that this is going to be a while, maybe by the weekend, by Monday next week. And so our efforts will start to go towards, okay, so because we're, other than Dr. April, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, I'm not anyone medical. So my ability to help people will be purely in a humanity type of uh, way of what can I do as a friend and as a neighbor. Um, and while all the medical specialists work on all the people coming into emergency and in the clinics and the doctor's offices, I think it'll be upon us to make sure that our, our neighbors are good, they're, they're healthy, they're emotionally strong enough, and, and they need to be encouraged that we're going to get through this. And we're all gonna we're all gonna get through this, and and we will figure this out afterwards. But for now, the point is, let's get as much help to the people who need it as possible. And what can we do to just keep ourselves safe? I think that's really where the focus is going to be, as far as us non medical people, other than Dr. April. Right. <laughs> Drew? And uh, I think on the financial side, well, I would just encourage people to uh, again revisit your budget. You know, tighten your belt where you can. Uh, you know, buy into your long-term goals. And uh, after revisiting your budget, if, if, if you are um, so fortunate to be able to be generous, um, 
I would encourage you to, to look for opportunities. I think, again, this is going to be a wonderful time for some great stories to emerge from this hard time. And uh, you could be one of those individuals that makes a difference in someone else's life. So if you do have the financial wherewithal to be able to uh, be generous at this time and to help a family in need, I think, listen, there's no greater way uh, to live life, quite frankly. And, um, you know, if, if you're a good steward of, of your finances, um, you know, that's going to be a, potentially a generational blessing that you'll see uh, in action through these times, I think. Perfect. Yeah, no, that that's a great point. And then, and then one thing I like to leave off of on my side is that, you know, I work in cybersecurity. I kind of see when people are like, you know, dealing with, you know, the house is on fire kind of situation. And, you know, they're, they're scared that everything's going to explode. Everything's going to happen. And I think, like you said, I think it's time to kind of look at, what do you need to do yourself? You know, breathing exercises, you know, I know for the, the military, they have the four fours, right? You inhale for four seconds, hold for four seconds, exhale for four seconds, right? And you do that, you know, until your, your parasympathetic and your sympathetic nervous system balances out so that you're not in a stressful state and start to react. So I think that's very important to look at those aspects. Also look at your nutrition, Right. Look at what are you eating? Eat healthy fruits and vegetables and things like that. They'll help your immune system. Right. And combat, you know, kind of stress and all that. The more healthy you eat, the more you can think, the more clear you can think and the more you can react and then get sleep. Right. Get good quality sleep, rest and kind of unwind meditation, things like that. Right. And then if you're not someone that can handle social media, right, and handle like kind of the the posts and everything that's going on and get you anxious, stay off of social media right now. Go to the news forums. If you need to have information, go to the WHO, things like that that are factual information, all that. But when it comes to, you know, information that's propagated that maybe you're not able to deal with, right, because it gets you anxious, gets you stressed, gets you overwhelmed, stay off of those platforms. You know, they're not going to serve you. They're not going to serve your family. They're not going to serve your community. Because, again, like everyone's saying, I think we all agree, it's a human, you know, issue right now that we all have to help each other and how all have to look out, out for each other. So I think that's kind of where I like to leave off. And I think, you know, I think would first th thank you all you, Monica, Joseph, uh, Drew, Dr. April. Thank you so much for coming out and just sharing kind of your value, valuable information and your knowledge. I think it was key to kind of talk about this subject in open form and share kind of what people need to know and then what people need to do. So thank you so much. So I just want to remind you, just don't forget, you know, be safe, kind of make sure we take care of each other. And just remember, Software's hackle, being connected is vulnerable. I'll see you next Daily Cyber.